I built a simple solar power setup both in and on my shed that powers all of my battery operated yard tools. And the process was easier than you might think. Here in my shed, I have a set of three Ego yard tools, the mower, the blower, and the trimmer. These run off of 56 volt batteries and the big five amp hour one here is no joke. This is a large battery and the charger draws around 500 watts at a time. I also have my newly acquired Ryobi post hole digger and my hedge trimmer with the Ryobi 40 volt system. So I need to keep those charged up as well. There are three basic ingredients to this setup. The first is the solar panels to bring in the sun's power. The second, an inverter with a lot of goodies built into it to convert the panel's DC power into AC power that we can use. And then the third is the batteries to store the sun's energy so that it's ready to use whenever we need it. You'll also need a few other little things along the way like wiring, fuses, and maybe some DIY storage will help quite a bit as well. The first thing we need to consider is your solar panels. We need to find out how we can best collect the sun's energy. And because the appliances that I'm charging here aren't small little appliances, these can take a decent amount of power. And because my roof direction is not optimal, the rooftops on my shed face east and west, unfortunately, and not south. So I wanted to get some stronger panels and not just the 100 watt panels that are commonly found in kits like these. I also wanted these panels to stay on the roof for good since I really don't need to move these around. I was able to pick up two of these 300 watt panels for about $120 each since they're refurbished. If you're looking for a good value on solar panels, I'll put some links in the description, but it's also a good idea to check out your local classifieds. You might be surprised at what you can find there. My big struggle here was figuring out how to mount these panels to the top of the shed because this is a lifetime shed where there is no maintenance required because everything on it is plastic basically. And I didn't want to drill a bunch of holes in it and cause any issues there. What I did is I just placed them up here and used some heavy wires to connect them to each other so that the two panels basically straddle the roof peak. These weigh about 60 pounds each so they were a little awkward to put up on the roof but once I got them up there they've stayed in place really well. In the future, however, I will be looking for a more permanent mounting solution for those, most likely involving some mounting rails. You may have noticed that I've got some other solar panels outside, and that's just an experiment I'm running right now. Those are actually powering the LED light bulbs that are in the shed, so I can work out here at night when I need to. And then I've also got an inverter connected to some batteries with those, so I have additional power supplies if I want to. I found that that is a lot less powerful than I want though. That's why I'm showing you this more robust setup here that can handle all of our chargers instead of that smaller setup that I did using almost exclusively products from Harbor Freight. These panels use traditional MC4 connectors which need to be routed inside the shed. Now fortunately I was able to find some small holes that came into the shed without me having to drill anything. So I was able to feed those wires in. If you're not so fortunate, you can definitely chop these off feed the wires in for a really small hole and then reconnect the wires together inside the shed. Just make sure to seal up that hole as necessary. Now before feeding them in, however, I did use these adapters that I already had. These are four in, one out MC4 adapters. And again, I'll put links to all of this in the description below. And that allows me to connect the two panels together in parallel, which means their amperage is combined, but not their volts. Because of the fact that I'm really just using two panels here and because of the inverter that I chose, I could really probably put these in series or parallel, but I chose to go parallel in this case. Just remember that when you wire things together in series, you add all of their volts, but their amps or amperage stays the same. The opposite is true when you wire in parallel. You combine all of their amperage together, but the volts do not change. With the panels set up on the roof and the DC power coming into the shed, I next needed to find a way to convert that DC power into AC power, as well as to be able to plug in all of my various tools. I chose this inverter here that I got from watts247.com. This is called the PIP1012LVMS. That's a mouthful, but basically it's an all-in-one inverter. Not only is this an inverter, but it's also a solar controller or an MPPT. It's an AC charger, an automatic transfer switch, which means it can be used to switch from solar power to AC power if you need to. It's got circuit breakers, temperature protection, and a whole bunch of other features. This is kind of an all-in-one solution, which makes this whole setup super simple. Now these run about $425, but I was not worried about that just because if you had to buy all of the individual parts that this thing does, then it would cost more than that and just kind of be a hassle. This takes a lot of the work out of it and keeps things really straightforward. Now this inverter can handle up to about 1000 watts of output and it can peak at 2000 watts for about 5 seconds before it goes overload and then will shut down. 
That actually is plenty to power all of this stuff that you see behind me and then some. The other cool thing about this particular inverter is that it works with just about any 12 volt battery setup. You can use lithium, LIFEPO, lead acid, flooded, AGM, anything you want really, as long as it adds up to 12 volts and ideally has more than about 100 amp hours of battery power. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. You can hook this up and use it. It'll convert that solar power, which is in DC, into AC and do all of the other things that it needs to do to keep everything balanced and then store it in your batteries for you and allow you to plug things into it so that you can power up your chargers and anything else you need. If you want to dive deeper into the details on this, it even has a little communication USB port where you can hook it up to a laptop, change some settings, and monitor how everything's performing. This inverter is easy to mount onto a wall because there's two holes right up top here and then down below, inside the access panel, there's other holes that are pre-drilled in here. Now, I actually drilled some larger ones on mine, so ignore those, but it does come with a couple of holes that you can just drive your screws right through to mount it in four locations. The third ingredient I needed to find were batteries. As I mentioned before, you can really use just about any type of batteries as long as they add up to a 12 volt system and ideally have more than 100 amp hours for a setup like this. So one day I was at Costco and I happened to be walking out and saw some golf cart batteries that were six volts each and they were 120 amp hours. They were pretty big, kind of like a car battery sized. And so I decided to pick up a couple of those. They were less than $100 a piece and to use those two together in series, which means that the two voltages would add up. So six and six is 12. That gives me the 12 volt setup that I needed for this particular inverter. These are what are called flooded batteries, which means they have some distilled water on top that you do need to check on from time to time to make sure there's sufficient amount in there. Now the temperature range on these is about negative four Fahrenheit to 113 Fahrenheit, or negative 20 Celsius to 45 Celsius. So that's a pretty good range, but if you need something even more extreme, you can look at silicate salt gel batteries, which can go much colder and warmer. But if the temperature range isn't as important where you live as size or weight, for example, then lithium or LIFEPO batteries are a great option too. In my case, I found that these two six volt flooded batteries are enough to power everything I use here, and there are no issues. With these flooded batteries, you do want to make sure that when it gets below freezing, that you're making sure you're not draining these below about 60%. Now, with our three main ingredients in place, we just need to connect everything up. Just to help keep everything tidy and organized, I built this really simple DIY set of walls here with a little bench underneath where I can store my batteries. Now this is not required by any stretch, but it just helps me to keep everything mounted and off of the shelves and off the floor. First, we'll run our MC4 connecting wires down into the shed like we showed earlier and into the inverter. Now I'd recommend putting a sufficiently powered fuse on your positive line so you can cut off the incoming power for working on the inverter. The positive and negative just connect to the PV leads here with a fastening screw. Easy peasy. You can make your own MC4 power line pretty inexpensively using some 12 gauge landscaping wire that you can pick up at Home Depot for example. I was however a little surprised to find that you can pick up this 12 gauge landscaping wire for considerably less money on Amazon than you can at Home Depot or Lowe's. Now you can connect the MC4s on one end of the two wires, the other end is going to go to the inverter. Now it's not hard to connect these, you actually just need a pair of crimpers to connect these inner pins on each one after you've stripped off about a half inch of wire and then you can feed the housing on like this. Next up, we need to connect our batteries, and for a setup like this, you really wanna get something that has wires that are four gauge or higher. Now, I had two gauge wires already. They're pretty expensive, but I happen to have enough extra, and I only needed a few feet of it, so I decided to use those. Once again, you can wire up the ends yourself using some heavy duty crimpers and these terminal lugs. You can buy these ready to use as well if you don't want to do any of that yourself. And once again, I actually found better deals on both the wire and the lugs than I could find at Home Depot or Lowe's. Now because mine are in series, all we need to do is connect one short wire from the positive of one battery to the negative of the other. We'll then run a wire from the available negative post from the open battery up to the inverter, as well as the available positive post on the other battery to the inverter. Just like with the solar panels, I'd highly recommend that you use a fuse here so that you have the ability to disconnect the power of the batteries so that you can work on the rest of the system. Really the only setup we need to do with our inverter at this point is to tell it what kind of batteries we have. If you're using AGM batteries, for example, that's the default, so you don't even need to do anything. Because these are flooded, I'm gonna go into the menu by holding down the enter key for five seconds or more, and then I can scroll through to the battery selection option. Once in there, I hit enter, and then select flooded. 
That's really all there is to it as far as setup for this thing. It's that simple. There are like a hundred other options that you can go through here if you want to. There's all kinds of menus in here where you can change the input voltage, output voltage, what watt limits you have, all kinds of cool stuff. So if you want to get into that, there's a manual that comes with it and it has everything you need there as well. At this point, we have DC power coming into our inverter. We have batteries to store the power, but we don't have a way to actually plug our chargers and other things into the power unit here. So what we need to do is to connect everything up with some outlets. Over on this side of the unit, we have a couple of sets of AC terminals. One is for input, one is for output. If you want to use the input one, that will give you the ability to plug this into traditional utility power. So for example, in my case, I could run an extension cord out to the shed. If, let's say, I wasn't getting enough power from the solar panels, I could just charge up my batteries from here. I mean, at that point, you could also just plug in an extension cord or a power strip to that and run everything off of that but it gives you the option to keep your batteries charged if you want to do it that way. It also gives you the option to connect everything up with a generator, for example, if you don't have access to plug-in power. The second set is our output, and you have a lot of options here. The simplest method is just to take a power strip, snip off the plug end, and then run your line, your neutral, and your ground into these ports. You can see they're labeled right here. We have ground, then line, then neutral. Keep in mind your ground is typically bare or green, your line is pretty much always going to be black and then your neutral will be white. Now because I do a lot of these videos and I love learning more about how electricity works, I have a bunch of outlets, I had a junction box and everything I needed to do this. So I basically wired up this metal junction box with two outlets in it. I took my new junction box and then mounted it to the back of the board here. And then I'm using some 12-2 Romex that runs into the inverter and connects on the AC output terminals. While it's possible to plug in, let's say, 30 different things at a time if you want to, just like on any traditional outlet that you have at home, you don't want to overload it. This is only a 12 volt system and it's only meant to handle so much, so you do want to keep an eye on that. For a couple hundred dollars more than this one, you can purchase a 24 volt system and that will allow you to do a little bit more as far as all the different things that you can run at once. But it's a good idea to keep an eye on your load here to make sure that you're not overloading the system. If it senses that you're going over the 1000 watts and up to that 2000 watts at a time, it'll allow that for about five seconds and then shut down. In the summer, we have a lot of sunlight hours and those solar panels up there are collecting pretty much everything that we need and I can charge everything we need, which is perfect because that's when we're using the most outdoor tools. In the winter time, I'm not likely to use as many of these tools, of course, to take care of the yard, but I might be purchasing a battery operated two stage snowblower and that has a couple of big 56 volt batteries that it uses. So we'll see if I end up doing that. But the nice thing is my panels are so low because the shed is fairly low in height that I can clean off the snow off those panels if I need to and I think that'll still give me plenty to work with as long as it's not snowing like crazy. Now it's not just yard tools that you may want to use out in your shed. Maybe you use that as a workshop space. So you can do some basic work out here. I wouldn't recommend trying to power everything like a table saw or a large chop saw for example off of this setup unless you go with maybe the 24 volt or even a 48 volt setup. I can, however, power, for example, this heat gun, both on the low and the high setting. It can handle that just fine. I'm even able to use this large die grinder, and this is a perfect example of what I mentioned before. When I turn it on, it requires more than 1,000 watts on that initial surge of electricity, but as it settles down, it goes way below 100% capacity and puts me down in the 20s, 30s, 40s at most, and so I can easily run a tool like this. Links to everything I've used in this video are in the description below, so feel free to check that out. I'll put some additional details down there as well. My name is Nils with Learn to DIY. Thanks for watching.